Morning, George. It's Tuesday morning again, and we have a phenomenal guest today who's going to talk about all things in independent practice in Georgia. Yeah, so we have Dr. Michelle Cook. Her title for today, the discussion is going to be about lessons learned from the retail failure of primary care and why. We're going to talk a little bit about independent practice, direct primary care. We're just going to mix it all up. So, Doc, we usually start with our pediatric friends and ask them, why did you become a pediatrician? But you're family medicine. So why did you become a family medicine and why did you go into DPC? The short answer, which is it's so hard. I'm a physician, I'm not a pediatrician, but I have taken care of children for most of my career. So I feel very adjacent to my kids' family in that respect. Family medicine, I went into it really because as a med student, when I rotated through all the rotations, I could see a little bit of myself in everything. And so when you can't really choose, I think you become a family doc. Love the kids, love the adults, love the women's health. Not a big surgeon, but I like a lot of those outpatient procedures. Family medicine allowed me to keep all of that in my practice and really develop longitudinal relationships with my patients. So that was the biggest draw. I worked in what we would call the traditional insurance-based pay-for-service model for approximately 10 years. What I tell people, my mantra now is I love what I do, but I hated the way I was doing it. The loss of autonomy, not enough time with my patients, endless paperwork, just feeling like it was a trap all the time. And my healthcare system collapsed. I'm in Atlanta, a large city, and one of the healthcare systems that was servicing South Metro Atlanta ended up closing two hospitals and multiple primary care clinics. And so that was a wake up call to me. I say it was a terrible day for the community, but for my professional career, it was my ticket out. I've been looking at the direct primary care movement for a while and just never felt brave enough to jump. And then when that happened, it just showed me that this model is not working. I say it was not for lack of patients that we closed. It's, it's because we had a business model that didn't support the community. So that the, the push and the bravery and the freedom from my non-compete to open my direct primary care practice, which is exactly what I did six months later. So direct primary care, I chose that because it allows me to be the family doctor I've always wanted to be, have time with my patients, relationships with my patients the freedom to have more time and visits to talk about the psychosocial issues that are impacting them. So it just, it's opened up my world for medicine and has allowed me to practice the way I always wanted to be able to practice. That's beautiful. But why didn't your health system collapse? So it's a large health system that services a good section of the Metro Atlanta area. And the part of the health system where I worked, so the whole system didn't close, but the section where I worked in Atlanta did close. They're, they've been trusted on citing all the reasons, but the major reason is that it wasn't financially stable. So we had a poor payer mix, if you will. A lot of the people in this community were Medicare, Medicaid, not a lot of commercial insurance, and many uninsured. The two hospitals that supported this region, one was a level one trauma center. So it was incredible to lose a level one trauma center in your city, but their emergency departments were so busy and serviced the most underinsured and uninsured patients in the community. So there's a lot of people coming in, getting care and services that was never compensated. So there was so much um, money going out and not money coming in that they eventually decided that it was unsustainable and close practices. The sad part about that is even though I was not a hospital-based doctor, the way today's healthcare system works is that primary care needs to be. They look at us as a loss. We work to feed the hospital. They depend on us for the referrals, for the mammograms, for the imaging, but they didn't really need us if we're not money makers, if you will. So when they close the two hospitals, they close all the supporting outpatient ambulatory facilities with it. So where did all those people go? There must be a lot of people. Good question. So I know you've seen my articles, which is why we connected. This is a healthcare crisis. Where do they go? I don't have an answer right now. So my practice is open and they are starting to trickle in here, but people are a little bit uncertain about the direct primary care model. Some folks have insurance and say, I want to be able to find an insurance-based doctor or some people don't have insurance. I've actually picked up several uninsured patients, such as small business owners who are like, look, I, I have an income, but I can't afford two or $3,000 a month for a healthcare premium, but this is a great affordable option. So I've picked up a lot of people that way. But the, the short answer is there's not a lot of care options here. Many of the patients that join my practice today have been out of primary care for more than a year and a half. They wow. haven't been able to found a replacement or they're traveling further for their care. So it's a real crisis here and we're not talking about it. So well, thank you for highlighting it. And so I, I want to dig a little bit deeper into this. It, it does Medicaid in Georgia pay as poorly as it does in Virginia? You're at about 60, 60% of Medicare. So you really can't have a business like that. Yeah, Exactly. It pays very poorly. Georgia is one of the states that also didn't expand, didn't do Medicaid expansion. 
So I thought about Medicaid expansion. I do think it's a short-term thing, but with such a poor reimbursement rate, right? getting more people on Medicaid doesn't really solve the problem for what you just mentioned. If it reimburses so poorly, then it's not really helpful to take it. Also oh, here, the for your experience, So your experience, it's very sad, but one that we hear a lot. And yeah. that it, it annoys me because there is a well-organized movement to expand Medicaid with our fixing payments. And they say that you will get people that look like the people in the community to go out to these communities that are underserved. Right. But that doesn't happen when Medicaid pays so poorly that it doesn't matter the color of your skin, you can't hold the business. Exactly. And the hospitals are as cutthroat as you will get. Did they close a pediatric unit and a birthing unit and basically let go of all the family practice of pediatricians in the area? Yeah. And are they by any chance are they by any chance protected by not paying taxes as a not for profit organization that don't don't contribute to their own community because they don't pay they don't pay property taxes like you and I do on our homes right. or like I do on my car. Oh so that, this is a wake up call. This is a dangerous yeah. path, but sorry for that experience, but it seems like you're in a better place right now. Yeah. Much better place, but you've highlighted all the things. That's exactly what happened to my system. The two hospitals that closed did have maternity wards. We had labor and delivery, which are now gone. Oh. Two less to deliver, to deliver care. If you know anything about Georgia, we're one of the worst in the country in terms of maternal fetal health. The rate of especially Black women dying in pregnancy or having pregnancy-related morbidity and mortality rivals that of um, underdeveloped countries. When my friends get pregnant here, I'm truly afraid for them. I want to be happy for them, but I'm really terrified because I know that there's not a great place to get care. Or if there is a great place to get care, it's overburdened because of the lack of other resources that are available or that you know aren't. What, you know what's interesting? I am sure the systems did not close because of lack of patience. That part. If you see a patient, you send a bill, you get paid, you're good. But if you send a bill and the reimbursement is poor, and that's what happened in pediatric medicine, yeah. they got everybody on Medicaid, which was a good idea to get the children Medicaid so they don't wander around without any insurance. But somebody needs to bump up the reimbursement. New York, fortunately, is going up and up. Yeah. But still, there's still bureaucratic and lots of administrative headaches. But let's get back to the original topic. Retail-based healthcare clinics. Was that a good idea or was that a bad idea? I think the answer is always somewhere in the middle. I do. I like the idea of having more options in the market. And so I right. think probably clinic could have served a purpose. And I, I'm by no means an expert here to talk more about DPC and outpatient side. But I think mm -hmm. it could have been helpful for some of those short things. I think some of those urgent care issues after I right. got a sore throat, something that needs a quick checkup. I think it's useful for that and the convenience of it is great. Pharmacy is right there. If you get the UPI, you pick up your meds, you walk out the door. Where I think it went wrong is that it tried to deliver primary care. And I don't think that primary care in that setting works well. Number one, because of the benefit of primary care, but the beauty of primary care is really the continuity of care. And when we have these structures that aren't private, I feel like there's no investment from the clinicians to want to stick around. I say now doctors are almost like NBA players or NFL players. We'll go to the highest paying team, right? But we don't always stay in our communities because if we get a better contract, we're gone. So all those people who rely on us are care are just gone. So that's not true just for retail clinics, but even for these large healthcare organizations. Whereas you and I know with private practice, like that's your baby. You're invested. You're going to stick it out. You're there for your patients for the long haul. You're not just going to pick up and leave because it got inconvenient. You figure out a way to make it work. So I think for long-term relationships, private practice works better. The second place I feel like I failed is for the reason I referenced earlier, primary care needs a beat to fee. They closed all of our clinics because we didn't have a hospital to fee. They said that we were really a, a referral center. So we were looked at as a operational loss, but we'll take a loss on primary care or break even on primary care so that we can get the referrals into our system. If you're CVS, Walgreens, or Walmart, who are you referring to? They're not going to keep the referrals to the surgeons. They're not going to get the benefit of patients going for mammograms or other imaging studies because it's only used for primary care. So they realize very quickly that reimbursement does not honor primary care. And Walmart made that very, they said there is no path to profitability and we are shutting down effective immediately. Yeah, but I think what their idea was 
to basically have the patient, the customer come in, take care of the sore throat of little Johnny, then maybe walk down the hall, pick up some hairspray, some deodorant, then fill the prescription for amoxicillin. And oh, while I'm at it, let me get some milk also. So I think I that think was the original model. I think each model is very different, right? In a retail clinic. So I think that if you start with a Walmart model, was they have a lot of stores in rural America that have no access to primary care. Right. And in their mind was, okay, people are already driving an hour because that's what happens in rural America. There's not a Walmart in every little town in Appalachia. People drive an hour to a super Walmart and they have everything and they're like, they're already driving for an hour. They might just want to get their, you know, kids vaccines while they're here and, right. you know, go back to town. Makes sense. But as you said, scaling primary care is incredibly difficult. And I've always said, you cannot do the Walmart model in medicine because medicine is hyper local. And so you need a building, you need an exam room or a van where to examine the patient. And you can't outsource that to China, Vietnam, Costa Rica, Colombia. You can't. It's it, you got to have the van or the office in the town and pay town uh, rates for that rental property. When you hire somebody to help you in your van or in your office, you got to pay them enough money that they can live in the U.S. Right. You, it's right. not like I wanted to outsource my phones, my Apple phones, to be made in China, and they cost three hundred dollars, and I sell them for a thousand dollars. That's not possible in medicine because you have to be where the patient is and they can't fly to China for their sore throat. So one more was that model, right? right. Um, Walgreens was what I call catching up. Yeah. So Walgreens saw that CVS had the minute clinics and was expanding and they don't, didn't want to get left behind. So they bought Village MD and another primary care company. And their model was to put the primary care company on top of their building because people are already coming to the same place. They'll pick up their prescriptions. Again, what they didn't realize is that this is a very difficult beast. And yeah, maybe people will come to the doctor, but they'll still go to their grocery store to get their prescriptions filled, or they'll go to uh, CVS or what, wherever, right? And so now, the other thing Walgreens was chasing after was they were chasing after uh, Medicare Advantage because that is very profit. Right. So if you have a good upside risk contract with Medicare Advantage, you can be getting paid seven or eight thousand dollars for Medicare on the only to take care of them, everything together. And if you can reduce the cost of care uh, on the eighty-year-old diabetic uh, with a little uh, heart congestion. You, there's a lot of money to be made there, yeah. but they couldn't make it. They can't make it. They're divesting of that too. And then there was the Aetna CVS, which is a very interesting story. So Aetna used to so be- Let's get very, back to that at the end of the podcast. Let me finish. So Aetna, Aetna used to be a very good insurance company with Mark, uh, Mark uh, was CEO of it, but they realized they couldn't compete with the larger ones like United Healthcare. So their model was to create a partnership of insurance and healthcare hubs, where, as you were saying, CVS was going to do the mammograms, was going to do the hearing aids, was going to do the primary care, and it was all going to be integrated. And then the plus side of that was they are going to be able to get a short set as people walk by, they're going to buy the bottle of wine that's twice as much as everywhere else and it stinks because it's on the, it's there, it's convenient. And you've had a heck of a day with a kitten on or it's three fever. You need to make a good dinner and a glass of wine. And that program is failing for head and there. So those were the three models, right? And then a bunch of urgent cares everywhere. I think all of these things, all of these models are based upon immediate gratification, service efficiency. But Doc, what do you think about service efficiency versus care quality? There's no relationship. As you said, longitudinal relationship with those people. Those people are docking the boxes. 
They're right. there for a shift. They leave. They move to another one. They don't know who Dr. Cook is. That's really where care fails. And if you ask any physician, we're always, we're usually, not going to say always, but usually happy to cover for our colleagues, but we know how hard it is to see a patient that you don't know. Yeah. You have a patient that you've been seeing for years, them a simple, pro or even a complex problem can be made so much simple because you already have that history. You know them so well. But when you're in a model where every time, like you're seeing a different patient, you can't deliver the best care because you just don't know that patient. And that's really what this relies on. One of the things that a lot of us get to hear is when a patient comes in and say, oh, my information's in the chart. The chart is God knows how long. It's like asking somebody like to look for a small piece of information in an encyclopedia. Like there's, it's hard to find that information up front. And that's where knowing your physician, knowing your doctor makes all the difference. And that's, that's just where they can. It's relationships. And we keep talking about that relationships with the patients, the longitudinal care, continuity of care. You would not believe how many people go to different various urgent cares around two or three visits. I went there. They told me I had a virus. I went back. They did a test. They told me I had another virus. It comes the third time and I'm coming to you to fix me. And the kid's getting worse and worse. I says, did you tell them that you have asthma? Yeah. Oh, and that was important. Right. I just looked in the chart and he was in. Did you tell me you're on albuterol? Did you tell right. me you had a lot of steroids in the past? Right. That's very right. interesting. And I want to stick to that point because I think where the viral infection, that's a beautiful way to talk about what, what goes wrong with these retail clinics. You and I treat this all the time. Viruses are going to be here. And most cases don't need antibiotics, right? right? But patients come in, they pay their copay, they see that doc in the box. They're like, I'm sick. I need antibiotics. And a lot of times right. they don't. But when they pay their money, there's this pressure to want to give them what they want, the instant gratification. So I get that in my practice too. If Dr. Cook, I'm the sickest I've ever been. I tested positive for COVID. It's time for my antibiotics. If you have COVID, I know you don't need antibiotics. We know it's a virus. You're going to feel horrible. Let's talk about the supportive things you can do. But I say, you know, there are some people that get worse. There are some people who are developed a bacterial infection. If that happened, call me back and we'll take care of it. And in a direct primary care model, that's part of their membership fee. They're not paying an additional propay to come back. Whereas if the doc in the box, they're going to have to pay to come back. So you better fix it the first time. So yeah. it just, it really, it, it disincentivizes not what you mentioned about quality care is let's take the more conservative approach when it's appropriate, not over treat you because that's inappropriate to do. And if things get worse, you're not fearful of coming back because of a loss of, um, of finances to be able to access that, that doctor. I think the, like the retail clinics, urgent cares and so forth, they don't have the luxury of telling them, I don't think, I don't know exactly what you have yet. I don't think it's too serious, but I'd like you to come back and follow up in two days and we'll see what happens. Cause problem, I always say in pediatric medicine, problems don't go away. Yeah. <laughs> no, a great way to put it. And a lot of people, like those URIs, you're going to feel horrible, but then five days later, you're going to feel so much better. And if that's true, then great. And we're done. And if you're feeling worse, then we need to readdress that. But patients get very upset. Like I was here only five days ago. Why didn't you treat me more aggressively there? And that's the wrong answer for medicine. Not everyone is right. treated like on the front end. And that's what we're seeing happen at these retail clinics. Now let's dive into, let's compare some models. Let's compare retail-based clinics to traditional private practice insurance clinics to DPC practices in terms of quality and patient satisfaction. So let's go with what you know. Of course, you, you always go with the easy questions, right? Yeah. So I'll full, full disclosure, I never worked in a retail clinic, so I can't really speak to that right. experience from a clinician standpoint. What is funny though, is I remember as I was burning out and looking at different models or looking at different options before I started my direct primary care practice, I was getting letters from Village MD. Come here, let's have a better care experience. I was getting letters from Walmart Health. And thank God I didn't follow up on those because I'd be back in the same boat looking for what I'm going to do with my life. Now. But I will talk about the fee-for-service experience versus the direct primary care experience. Sure. For me, fee-for-service. I'm going to back up because we didn't really talk about what direct primary care is so far at the show. So I think we're coming with okay. Direct primary care is a, a membership-based model of care. So rather than do fee-for-service or pay-for-visit, our patients essentially subscribe to our practice. So they pay a monthly membership fee, which is pretty much all-inclusive of care. Different direct primary care are set up a little bit differently where they have a membership fee and maybe there's a small cost per visit or small cost for medications or for labs. So there may be some other costs baked in, but generally to be a member of that practice, it's a flat monthly membership fee. So my patients pay a monthly membership fee and as many times as they want to come in, as few times we can do telehealth, they text me. So it's like having your doctor on retainer. Where I compare that to my fee-for-service life, remember I was working for a large healthcare system. 
And in that system, I feel like the biggest difference when you're in fee-for-service versus direct primary care, you are most profitable when your schedule is, you need all appointments booked, you need everything booked up um, because the patient's no-show or if someone doesn't come in at the loss of income that day. Versus in direct primary care, they pretty much pre-pay me of care. So it's almost like true value-based care. So my most profitable day is when I have a full panel of patients in an empty office because nobody's here, but they've already paid their membership. But that allows me the flexibility to have more availability in my practice. Before you're incentivized to book up your whole day because you need to get the revenue, whereas here, I don't necessarily need to book up my whole day and I can be much more flexible about the way I deliver care. So let's go back to that URI example. And somebody gets a viral infection and I have my fee for service model, that two day follow up is somewhat, it's impossible. Or at least that's the way I felt because I was overbooked and double booked and my schedule was booked to the brim. When somebody needed to come back to get them in quickly was so challenging. And oftentimes we would squeeze them in. But to me, one of the trigger words I have when I think about my fee for service life is, oh, can you work in this patient? Can you work in this patient? Working in a patient means that I am at my maximum. I really have no room for you and I'm squeezing you into an already packed schedule. So now I'm at 110%, 120% whatever that may mean. And you're not going to get the best of me because I'm taxed. I'm at my max. I can't think about this. If you're coming back, like you said, problems don't go away. And if you have a real problem, I need to be fresh. I need to be clear. I need to really think this through. What did you miss that first time that you're back? That's the person that actually needs a lot more attention because there could be something hidden there that I missed the first time. But when I'm working you in, that means you, I'm already expended. Like I don't really have that mental capacity to really dial into the patient the way I need to. Whereas in my direct primary care life, I see maybe a, a busy day is about six or seven patients. That's a busy day. Usually I'm seeing four to five patients, but I'm touching patients multiple times. So I'm sending them text messages. We're responding to portal messages. I might hop on a quick virtual call. So my in-office visits are minimal, but my touch points are very high. So when that patient comes back because things didn't get better, they're not feeling well, I'm dialed in. There's nobody else that's, that's waiting for me. I'm not like waiting to get into exam room three next because they've been waiting for an hour. Like I'm there with that patient. So that was a convoluted way of saying it, but I hope it, it demonstrates the point of the pressures that I have when I was in a fee-for-service environment versus being mm -hmm. in a direct primary care environment. Now, do you think it's the fee-for-service that's the problem, the patient that's the problem? the efficiency of the practice that's the problem i'm not sure yeah i'm not sure either i think it's a little bit off, a, a, a little bit some of everything i think we have to change the way that we deliver care what doctors get for care what patients expect for care i'm i'm glad that you said that because i did a talk last year at the georgia academy of family physicians talking about direct okay. care and the failure of a fee for service system and one of the docs approached me after the talk and he was like i don't think it's fee for service as a problem is I think it's more the insurance-based care that has all these misaligned incentives. He's like, offering a service and getting payment for that is not wrong or evil in and of itself. That's the way that business works. So giving a fee for a service isn't only the issue, it's the other structures that back that up, that say a visit is only complex and you document these different things or if you spend this much time and all that stuff that just, a lot in an insurance-based world, that leads to this misaligned incentives. Right, so, but that, I think all that, stems from when the CPT2, whatever, it came out in 1997, because what happens to physicians? They had to write progress notes by hand. You would not write them. Simple as that. So yeah. in it, I don't want to defend the insurance companies, but in their defense, you didn't write anything, Doc, yet you billed us a whole lot of money for what you didn't write. So why should we pay you? Yeah. So you had to justify it. But now with the EHRs and they changed the billing structures with the medical complexity and laboratory interpretations and whatever else you do, continuity of care. It's easier to, to justify a higher level of care. Right. I think. Um, I'm not so sure. That's why I, sometimes I wonder, everybody blames the fee for service, but I think there's a little bit of inefficiency, workflow, physician habits, physician OCD stuff. That all of it mixed up messes things up. I'm glad you said that because when I was, again, still in fee for service, and again, that issue of having to have this full schedule, that a wing was having a full schedule, and the full schedules was what we needed to break even or what we needed to make the income that we wanted. To me, it was just unsustainable. I know right. in PD, I see a lot of patients, and the primary right. care form is an adult patient that are very complex. More right. than 20, 20 is just too many. Now, for adult medicine, 
I think every person in adult medicine that's over 65 is probably a level five. They got right. 15 medications, 30 different problems on a problem list. But the truth of the matter is nobody would write that down in the past. I, I remember when I first went into private practice, we were on paper. Mm -hmm. I was always trained. You should ask your allergies. You should ask what medicines you're on, your problems. Yeah. The senior physicians would say, oh, you don't need to do that because it's already written in the chart. Yeah. But it should be part of the progress note each and every time. Exactly. Exactly. But you're right. Those patients are much more complex. But we're expected to see more than 20 a day. That's a lot. That's a lot for adult. That's a whole lot for adult medicine. If they're and 30 so, years old, 40 years old, yeah, they're probably okay. And to your point, like I remember trying to get myself to adapt to the system. I took this course, which was a great course about learning how to chart better, chart faster, close your charts as you go. And it helped me a lot, but I felt like it helped me take more abuse, if that makes sense. Like I got more efficient and uh, like I was letting go of some of the OCD and not every little thing has to be documented. Like what is the bare minimum that gets to the point of what the heart of the visit is and it's enough to build a visit. So I got much better about that. So as my efficiency went up, what happened? They're like, oh, great, Dr. Cook, there's more capacity. <laughs> I was like, no, I did this work at that not to be able to take on more and more because I already felt like I was beyond my limit. Um, so again, in trying to adapt to the system, I feel like it just it invited more and more trauma, if you will. Um, well, so it, now in my direct primary care right, in my direct primary care life, I am documenting for myself and for that patient, right? I'm not documenting to submit it to insurance. It doesn't really matter. Not to say it doesn't matter what I put in the chart, but it's less important than it ever was. So now I can document just what the essentials are. I've leveled that up, but now I'm using AI to help me with my documentation, which has totally changed the game. I know. Like, well, AI plays in the background. It captures the essentials of the common conversation, gives me a beautiful note. I maybe make it one or two tidy ups right there, and my note is done. I'm not adding like all the ICD codes. I don't have to ask exercise counseling because it's a pediatric well visit and with print, I won't pay for it if I didn't document that thing. Like it doesn't matter what the coding is. So now I feel like I can be in that room. I can dial in with that patient. I don't have to worry about taking comprehensive notes while I'm doing that. I close that chart and I can just be so much more efficient. So that's actually going to allow me to take on more patients in a way that doesn't feel stressful. Yeah. So we go back to the relationships and the longitudinal care. I'm using the AI also, and Dr. Bravo is using it also. I feel like I'm almost not working. And it's so much more enjoyable now, right? Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. All right. I can literally just put it to the side and yeah. talk with my patient. Yeah. And it's just made that it's so much more fulfilling now than it's ever been that I don't have to worry about the documentation. When I think about in the past, my level of documentation, my day would be I'd wake up at five o'clock in the morning. I would pre-chart for as many of my patients as possible because like, I have to get that in my head. Because once I get in the room, I got what, eight to 10 minutes to really get the job done. <laughs> so I have to come in as prepared as possible. So I would pre-chart for hours before I got to the office, collect the information and have to chart as much as I could. And then after work, Go back and cheat charting, right? And then oh. answer the portal messages and do the medication refills and do the lab results. It just never stopped. So every day was like a 16, 18 hour day. Well, that's uh, a lot. And, yeah. And it was business as usual. It was just like, that was not a bad day. That was every day. So I would say, it's, I didn't know if my day was going to be bad or worse, but those were the two options. It's either going to be a bad day or a worse day because of the amount of work that we had. So now I go in, my AI helps take the notes. So while my nurse is working at the next patient, now in between patients, I can answer that portal message. I can do my refill. The work is done at the end of the day. Now, it sounds like you did a lot, okay? Mm -hmm. Do you think it was that there was a lot to do? Do you think it was inefficiency on behalf of the physician? Do you think it was inefficiency on behalf of the clunky system, the EHR that they had where... You had to go through a lot of hoops to complete the same thing. Because it sounds like once you took the computer system out, your life is better. Right. I do think that the EHR system is incredibly clunky. It's something that's not going away. And there's a lot of benefits to EHR. I love the fact that you can look back more streamlined, that you can search the charts. You can like, okay, when did they last take them off the cell? And you type that and it takes you right to that date. So I don't think we can pull um, EHR altogether because there's some incredible benefits. Right. But I think we have define our relationship with it. In the fee for service model, and especially in the employee-based model, it was death by a thousand clicks. If I didn't yes. click the bag that I didn't reconcile the medications and the whole visit didn't count, and now I'm not going to get paid, regardless of whether I did it or not. So there's a lot of really foolish things that you have to do to justify your payments or to justify your care. 
And then if you automate those things, sometimes it could be somewhat fraudulent. Did you really do it? Or did you just program the machine to say that you actually did it? So I think it just puts you into a rock and a hard place about, about using these systems. I do think that there's some physician inefficiency, but I don't think the physicians really can be efficient if you're relying on inefficient systems, if you're dependent on these inefficient systems. So you really need the workflow. I remember one of the worst days for me was when I was in my like, service life, at one point I was able to negotiate getting 20 minutes of appointment. And that was my sweet spot. Like I still, I would never want to do that now, but I had 20 minutes appointment for everybody. And in the system, they said, no, we need to standardize. All of the physicians across the institution need to be on a 15 or 30 schedule. So it's going to be 15 minutes or 30 minutes for new patients and physical. And that loss of five minutes really hurt my workflow. Like having that extra five minutes per patient made all the difference. But then I was forced into this 15 minute model. And one thing I cannot do is see four patients an hour. I cannot see four adult patients an hour. And that would happen. Well, it would be like, okay, this is the diabetic. This is the depressed patient. This is a thyroid and hurt my foot follow up. Like in that an hour, two back to back hours of that. And I'm done. Yeah. I'm done. I still have an hour left of clinic to go. And I'm already behind schedule. So I think a physician can only be as efficient as the models that they're using. And when you have no say over your schedule, no say over your EHR, then I don't think the physician can get more efficient. I think to your point, this is another one of my big concerns. So adult diseases are bleeding into not only adolescent, but pediatrics now. Oh, yeah. And in pediatrics, there are very few quick appointments anymore. Oh my gosh, you're absolutely right. And the and when it doesn't pay to see them. And the other problem we're having is, and this is all because of efficiency and cost containment, we just simply don't get paid enough. We no longer have the luxury of having an RN in the clinics. We have a medical assistant. And some medical assistants, as in anything else, some are great, and some of them don't really understand the importance importance of a medical record, right? And they're, they're oblivious to it. And they don't understand that I can't do all the workup for every patient that comes into the clinic because it would take me an hour per patient. Right. So I need to count on extenders who do certain things and do it accurately at least 85% of the time. Right. So that I can look through that data quickly and move on to the problem and get the patient in, in, in a good track and move on to the next patient. Absolutely. And I feel like that is another thing that for, to your point, Dr. Rose, about efficiency, in those systems, they set the workflow. So I'm, I'm a millennial doctor, if you will, but I came in right at the end of paper charting and EHRs. So I watched that transition and I watched the burden of documentation and administrative work push towards the physician. So a simple example of that would be something like a referral, right? So when I was a med student watching the doctor that I, um, I, I um, would rotate with, they say, this patient needs a referral, let's refer them to neurology. They sign the paperwork and their staff to do the rest. Now they can move on to the next patient. But now I'm in a system where there's a big epic EHR and only the doctor can click referral, right? But other members of your team don't even have access to that button. You know, that that's below, that they're not at the level, security level to be able to do referrals. Only you can make that decision. So now I'm the only one that can do referrals. I'm the only one that can target so many things because of the clearances I have in my EHR and I can't spread around. So that's another thing that's helped me again with my efficiency here in my direct primary care practice. Now I decide who can do what. So yes, ultimately I have to sign off on it, but I can say this patient needs to be referred and my staff takes care of the rest or this patient needs whatever it might be, and I can delegate that to my staff so I can truly work at the highest level of my life. Yeah, and, and to, to your point, like yesterday, it was a very frustrating day in clinic because of the way they schedule the patients. They, they brought in five physicals at 30 in the morning. Oh my gosh. Okay, and, and one of the physicals is an 18 month old and the mother filled the paper M chat and she marked that the kid's not playing with toys, doesn't bring toys to her, doesn't point with her fingers. But the medical assistant documented that the MCHAT was normal in the EMR. Yeah, but who's responsible? Do you think the medical assistant is trained to understand that? George, a monkey could be trained to do that. All you're doing is there's a set of questions, yes and no, and then there's form in the EMR, and you click yes and no. 
she is lazy and stubborn and doesn't want to learn. And so she just clicks yes on all and po it populates a field on ECW. That's a f inefficiency once right there. So it's inefficiency okay. twice, right? But it's also dangerous because I'm giving the wrong information. So I did an ASQ 18 months and the kids got glo global developmental delay. Uh -huh. So I'm, I'm already behind and now I have a problem to deal with. Okay. But and then I said, okay, I need you to go see OT, speech therapy, and early intervention. Write the referral because that's a workflow. So they put it in the CW, the referral, where it's going, but it's documented that we refer the patient. Mm -hmm. She didn't put it in the computer. Okay. So that's the kind of problem that if you had somebody that had a two year LPN degree that had been trained on the importance of documenting properly because you're dealing with somebody's child. Yeah, but other, you're not the, dealing with a widget. But what you're describing is not medical assistant level work. This is doctor work. Or M chat, 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 M chat looking at it. I transcribing it, George. You no, don't not, even not do it. In a number. You send it on you send it on Freesia and it yeah. comes back and it populates and then you look at it. Yes. But okay. as I tell the students all the time, I do a formal developmental questionnaire. I ask all the questions and I observe the stuff. Then if I see something funny, that M chat better agree with me. Okay. Okay. So this is a person not doing her job. That's yeah. really what it is. And, but it's a problem because it can make you make the wrong choice. Right. Plus it delays you. Plus it's a bunch of rework. Yeah, and then you a little bit of rework. Be reimbursed on thoroughly. It's hard to find and attract the staff. Yeah, right. A good LPN, a good two-year RN. They were ph phenomenal, fabulous. You came in there. Everything was set up for you. You could trust them. When they told you when this kid's sick or this this kid doesn't look right or I don't know what's wrong with this kid, but I don't think the mom answered the M chat correctly. So all of these things having to. Be responsible for the care of the patient, trying to be personable, mm -hmm. trying to understand the needs of the parent, then trying to document it on ECW, which I am not a fan of. And then on top of that, having to double check everything the assistants have done, because you can't trust them to do it right. You cannot see three patients an hour. I don't know. It's a and tough so again, it goes back to that. You have to find a balance. I don't think medical assistants are trained. I don't think it's in their job description to make medical decisions. Yeah. They can't They're even give medical. shots. They can't even get shots. Oh, Do you know why in New York they can't give shots? Do you know why they can't give shots in New York? The nurses lobby legislature. Besides that. So the reason is they cannot make a medical decision to decide what vaccine to administer. That's why. Can they not follow up the physician order though? So the physician orders vaccine, can they, like, they can't, they just can't do the injection. Like they, can't they can't do anything. Nurse LPNs, they can follow a physician order. Okay. So if I see a patient, I order a varicella vaccine, the LPN can administer the vaccine that I said, because I made the medical decision process. Medical right. assistants can't even do that. They can do vital signs. They can put patients in. They can plot growth parameters and the RN, a higher level of training, that's the one that can go look at a medical record and say, hey, you're due for your MMR and she can administer it. Got that's it. hierarchy. Right. I don't think personally a medical assistant can make medical decisions. They can follow, they can execute commands, I think. They can wow. do vital signs, but that's it. They, they train for a year or two, not even. Yeah. Anyway, so we yeah. derailed again, Herb. <laughs> Let's get back to this retail and uh, retail-based clinic. Why do you think all this retail-based clinic stuff happened? Was it just a play on Medicare or value-based medicine? I don't think it existed back then, value-based medicine. But the right. Medicare advantage, as Herb said earlier, was probably a, a factor in it. I think they saw a business opportunity. Mm -hmm. And I think that they did not thinking to what, especially private practice and hospitals have been saying for a long time about how poor the reimbursement is. 
there is a track where if you can play the game correctly, then you can get rewarded really well, right? So when I was in my healthcare system, we were part of an ACO and everything we did was like basically a Medicare way. Like if we hit this benchmark, if we get so many Medicare physicals, if we cross that threshold, we're going to get this big dumb bonus for Medicare. So really our patient became Medicare. Regardless of what our patients needed, our patient was Medicare. We need to do the physicals, we need to do these many screenings, we need to do... And some of that trickled down to what the patient needs, but many times it did not. It did not. So I'll tell you an example in my office was because we had to do so many Medicare physicals, like I think at one point we set a target of like 85% of our patients need to have their Medicare physical, which is good to do. But then what happened to my schedule? My schedule became full of Medicare physicals, whether the patient wanted it or not. So when my patients were trying to come in because they were feeling bad or there was a new issue, I was crowded out by all these Medicare physicals. Because again, I was treating the wrong person. I was treating the wrong patient. So I think the retail space tried to play that game and quickly understood that it is a no-win game. It's really hard to make up Medicare requirements. It's hard to get people to do things that they may or may not want to do. Like some folks are just they don't want to come in for the Medicare physical. Doesn't mean I can't take care of their other issues, but they don't want to sit there and do that questionnaire. They didn't want to, like they just didn't want to do it. So it doesn't mean that they can't give them care, but if you don't give them the care the way that Medicare wants, then you're not going to get that big bonus that comes down the pipeline. Yeah. If you have too many patients to be seen, I don't know, my simple mind, that means bring on another doctor. What's wrong with that? But a hospital system will not bring on another doctor until the first doctor is overwhelmed, overspent, break down. And then they bring a new doctor that's younger and theoretically faster and cheaper. But that one's even more inefficient. Right. Can't even yeah. half of what that but, doctor. But, but we also see it in, in pediatrics. There are some practices that pretty much just do well child exams all day. Yeah. And very few sick visits. And they've, they've, they're okay with it. They're like, I can't compete with the urgent care that's open seven days a week from okay. noon from, from noon till 10 p.m. And people don't have to make an appointment. They don't have to do anything. They just walk in and they give them what they want and they leave. And I, there's no way I'm going to be able to be open from noon till 10 p.m. This is not going to happen. And I'm not going to find pediatricians to work Saturdays and Sundays or nurse practitioners or PAs. And I, I guess I'll just have to make peace with that and see them on follow-up. Yeah. And so that yeah, really that's hasn't so helped cool. in some ways. Yeah. So I sat cool. in on a discussion once at an insurance level meeting where they brought in a whole bunch of independent practices, urgent cares. To, it was like a brainstorming mastermind thing, right? And I'm sitting next to this guy that had an urgent care and how busy he is. And then I'm also sitting next to some primary care physicians in the community. And then I said to the urgent care director, I says, I don't understand how all these guys are sending all their patients to you guys during the middle of the day when they should be seeing them. He says, doc, the secret sauce is they're all capitated. So they have to see these patients, but they want to see the well care so they can get their quality incentive program. And they send all the sick visits to us in the urgent care. So we're feeding the beast and everybody's happy. And this was in an insurance forum. Right. Yeah. And that, that's exactly what happened. And that, that drove me insane. So at my office, we had our system had an urgent care less than a mile away, less than a mile away. So I didn't get the game back then, but the game was, yes, we go after the higher ticket. Then there's like the Medicare physicals and the new patient appointments. Then when that's exam with them, they can go to urgent care, no matter you know what was going on. So I got so tired of sending my patients to urgent care. So it felt like a no way situation in that. My patient will call the same day. I've already booked at 100%. Dr. Cook, can you work this patient in? So there's my dirty word. And sometimes I would try to work them in and I would feel totally exhausted or you can send them to urgent care. So I'm, I was sending people to urgent care, but then they go to urgent care and when they finish doing whatever they do, they what's the next statement? Follow up with your primary care. So they try to follow up three days later and still my availability is shot. Like I wasn't available for two, three, four months out. My same day appointments, my staff are overriding the schedule. I'm like, we need to get this person. So my same days were all gone. And when I watched the game from the from this perspective of seeing what was happening, we didn't really care about what the patient needed. We cared about what was going to pay them up. And I think that's how that happened. For me as a primary care doctor, it feels horrible to look my patient in the eye and say, I'm going to be your physician, but when you need me, go somewhere. I'm going to send you to urgent care. And this is in this direct primary care model, I no longer have to do that. When they come in and they're sick, I see sick care again. I actually had to rush up on my sick care skills, but I wasn't even seeing that. Funny. 
Sorkler. So I went into the strep throat protocol because they never even made it to me because if it was a sore throat, the staff protocol would ship them to urgent care. That's a low level visit. They don't need to come here. We need to pack up schedule with these Medicare physical patients. Yeah. All right, Dr. Bravo, the last question. This is your baby. <laughs> Why don't you take it away? The last question. I, I think these, the, this is the really sad part of the story, right? The, we take Aetna as an example. Aetna was a early adopter of the nurse practitioner model in the retail clinic. I don't think they made money at it, but they weren't losing money at it. Then they tried to expand the model to make it a healthcare hub, which to me didn't make any sense because I don't know, this is just me, but as a consumer, I feel CVS is low quality and very expensive. I think of the CVS when I'm at the beach and that's the only place I can go get a pair of flip-flops because I forgot mine. And they're not the nice flip-flops, but they cost a lot of money, right? That's and, and it's cluttered and, it, and everything is packed. It's, I, I rather not shop at CVS. And I'm like, if I feel like that, I bought a pair of flip-flops. Why on God's earth would I go to the doctor at CVS? That's just, I, I was just, that was my first question when they did that. Then when they made some investments in clinics and then went very aggressively after Medicare Advantage, they lost their shirt. So they've lost $2 billion is in their last report. And they fired the CEO of that division. And what do they do? What do the insurance companies do? The CEOs, CFOs, the C-suite, they don't take pay cuts. Never. <laughs> their bonuses don't decrease. Their stock options don't decrease. What is it that they do? They turn around and they tell the people that have to buy health insurance. Our loss ratio was 95% last, last quarter. We were supposed to be at 85%. So I have 10% emit co cost and 5% margin. Therefore, I need to raise your uh, healthcare premiums for your company by 15% this year because of the mistake I made going into the wrong market and not knowing how to manage it. That's how they solve the problem. And then the second thing they do is they go look for the independent practices, the ones that are in the community, the ones that are not affiliated with a mega not-for-profit health system that breaks their arm when they come to the negotiating table and say, oh, we're gonna bundle G2211 it's a good code, but it's part of what you're already getting paid for the SIG visit. And we're going to bundle this and we're not going to pay for a screening test. And we're not going to, you have to do it because it's part of your quality, uh, well, they're your QIP and it's the right thing to do, but we're not going to pay for you to do it. And by the way, we know we haven't raised your fee schedule in a couple of years, but we don't, we can't afford to raise your fee schedule right now. I'm below Medicaid in my state with what you're paying me. Yeah, we know it's terrible, but right now we can't afford to raise your rates. If that's not good enough for you, we understand you'll have to leave, but we're okay with that too. That's how the health insurance plans work when they lose money for silly decisions. And we are, as you had said at the beginning of the episode, we are at a healthcare crisis, primary care, I'm tired, and I, I don't mean to be offensive, but I'm tired of hearing about, what, what is it now? Uh, freedom DEI or DEI or IED or people, everybody needs care. Everybody needs access in every community. And you're never gonna attract people of any color, any background, any lived experience to go to a place where you can't make money after they spent 11 years of their life training and they have $300,000 in student debt to pay off. So the problem is payment. Yeah. Pay people to do the work that they're doing in every community fairly and people will gravitate because people, people that go into medicine are good people. They want to help other people. The orthopedic surgeon, yeah, he wants to make money, but he loves taking away pain. He loves it when he replaces a knee 
and that 50 year old can now start walking again and holding his grandchildren. I love it when I have a kid and they got a BMI of 38 or 39 and they weigh 217 pounds and they're down to 195 pounds in four months. Right. I love it. Right? That's why we went into medicine. Right. But if you want people to go into the communities, every community, pay them. Yeah. And you won't have a problem. I think with direct primary care does, it puts it back on, on us to set our payment rate. Right now, we're so dependent on insurance, which means, again, we have to play by their rules no matter if they make it or not. And so direct primary care has a radical approach because they work like any other thing. If this is the service I'm providing, this is the price for it. And right. as you can see, yes. the market, there are going to be some places that operate more like a CVS, like we're going to be a little bit more, or we're going to be a little bit cheaper option if you want to. You have some places that want to get more concierge level care, you're going to have places in the middle, and then the consumer can shop for that. But what needs to happen on top of that is we need to change this insurance paradigm to make it truly insurance where it covers the catastrophic and the unusual and not every. And that's why I'm in direct primary care, because I think that we can't, we've asked them to pay us more and more. And what happens is premiums go up and we don't see that, right? Like it goes to the right. wrong place. Well, the answer right, right. now is more money, but redistributing that money. So let's make these premiums smaller. Let's make insurance more affordable and only use it where we really need to use it when you need that free knee replacement or you need to get hospitalized. When it comes to your primary care, the care that really could be very inexpensive, we decouple that and we make it affordable. So I think I'm done asking insurance companies to pay me. I set my rate. Yeah. And I let the market. Yeah, that's very nice. Very good. Very interesting. Like I said, I, when we spoke earlier, I did catch tail end of when they were paying with chickens and the eggs, but the, but the fees were very inexpensive. Like I said, they used to start with $25 visits. Now they're $200 visits. And what do you do with expensive? The well, here's the thing, it's expensive, right? And I don't share if you're willing to, I want to share mine. I'll tell you, I'm on a very affordable plan through the NCA and I paid $400 a month to cover myself. That's a lot of money, right? $400 a month, whether I get a visit or not, just make sure I have that coverage. I can beat that. We pay $4,000. $4,000, right? So that's imagine if I pay even just $1,000 for catastrophic coverage. So if I need my New York place, I need my hospitalization, yes. and then my other $3,000, I can divert. A $200 visit, if you're already paying $3,000 a month for coverage that you may or may not use, is nothing. So it's, sure. you can reallocate that money toward your direct care or toward your, your maintenance care, then it makes sense. But we're just spending the long way. You're we're correct on that. And it doesn't I, work. I think it's by design. They want to do that because maybe people that are younger, they don't go to the doctor. They still spend the money or the hospital spends the money for them or the mm -hmm. practice spends the money for them and they keep rolling and rolling. And the sad part about it is the company that we use doesn't even embarrass at how much they pay the physicians. It's embarrassing to me how much they pay the yeah. physicians. Yet we're, well, we're paying money already. We're yeah. it's yeah. not going to care anymore. And so that's where direct primary care is let's stop eating the beef. Like we're yeah. done doing that. And it's hard because right now it's hard not to do both. We don't really have a lot yeah. of catastrophic only options just based on the way insurance is structured right now. Some people are, are finding loopholes in that through health share. So there's companies out there where it's not necessarily insurance compliant, but you can get an insurance like product that will protect you if you have a high cost event, but then you pay separately for your primary care and almost always you're going to save money. So in the end, you can get this incredible cost savings and you could splurge on your primary care doctor and spend 300 of this if you're no longer paying 4,000 a month for your insurance. So I just think we have to change the way that we're paying for care and cut a lot of those folks out of the equation. Like you said, those CEOs that don't take a pay cut but keep increasing premiums. But for some reason, with these increased premiums, this will create add to Medicare Advantage where a physician, they're going to take a 2.9 cut next year. Yeah. And they're increasing and they're increasing the practices payment by 10% this year. Yeah. And when you negotiate with them, they want to give you an increase of 1%. So many but, levels are wrong. But, but there's also a problem there. And, and I think you, you alluded to it, which is very important, is we need to invest more and, and family practice is a little different than pediatrics. We need to invest more primary care, early detection prevention in the young. If you can prevent, if you have a well-managed asthmatic and they're not going to the hospital, that's big saving. If you can get 
teenagers to come into adulthood with a BMI of 25 and not 33 or 34, that's going to be less spend on joint replacements. If you can keep that young person from being overweight and becoming a diabetic, that's a huge saving long-term on the system. But you're talking about decades and decades. And to do prevention, it costs money. Prevention, because what people look at is what they spend, what you say. It's hard to... But you can't tell what you say, because how do you know, the road. You know that child was going to be a diabetic and going to end up in dialysis when they were 50, when he's 16, and he's well, a pre-diabetic? You don't. But... It's you know what happens when you talk about prevention. Yeah. So, and, and so until we spend more, invest more, it's, it's going to be a tough walk. We're going to have to spend more up front. Or we have to spend differently. We have to spend more initially to provide the preventive care that you're going to see that pay out 30 years down the road. And so that's going to save money. And at the same time, in the most expensive population, you're going to have to need, find ways of providing quality without it being so expensive. Right. And that gets but, very touchy because that's where the hospital makes all its money. And I, I agree, but I still disagree. I don't think we need to spend more than we need to spend differently. The hard part is that's taking money out of some people's pockets who are going to be very reluctant to give that up. Right? Yeah. Do we need those managing care? Do we need more thousand dollars insurance policies? I'm sure you didn't like you got more than twenty thousand dollars worth of care last year, but that's what you spent more than that just to get yeah. your health care. Yeah. So we're all spending the money, we're just spending it so inefficiently. Correct. Right. We change the way we're spending that money. We take the money away from the health insurance and put it back into these private practices and put it back into the hands of consumers. We're going to see better outcomes. But I think when we lead the conversation of ready to spend more and we're already toppling our economy with our cost of health care, that conversation is not going to go very far. I don't think we need to spend more. I actually think we can spend less. But there's some people that don't need to be making money in health care right now. Yeah. Well, that's a tough podcast in itself, Herb. Her. Right. That is. But that's very interesting. Yeah. And if, I, I do love the DPC model in the sense yeah. that you're not nickeling and diming people. Yeah. Right. You're like, here, here's what it's going to cost for me to take care of for you for a year. Like your accountant, your yep. tax return is going to cost $3,000 and I'm going to file this and that and blah, 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 blah. And just call me when you need something. And, but it's $3,000. Exactly. Yep. And, and I'm not going to do anything but that and we're good. And yep. so people can budget that in and it's not that expensive. It's many times less than what you pay for your cell phone at Verizon. Exactly. It is. It I remember is. that even though I'm considered one of the more expensive offices, I'm not $3,000 free. <laughs> but yes, you invest in your financial health, but our physical health and our mental, emotional wellness, is so much more important. If we're not well, who cares how much money? Right. That's right. It's, right. So it's crazy right. that you'll pay your accountant $3,000 a year, but we him and ha about paying our primary care doctor $3,000 a year to get yes. unlimited. I just think we have to change that paradigm. And once we start yes framework and makes more sense and we're going to save a lot of money not necessarily have to spend more money let's see what happens i like to thank you dr cook this was a spectacular we have to cut herb off because he won't stop talking about this stuff um, <laughs> so much but i really yeah, we'll it. have to invite you back to where we can talk about should we spend more or should we spend less all right oh, let, me, let me tell you this before we we, we uh, sign out I, I was working on a slide deck for another project and i'm a very simple man so i just drink Black coffee, no sugar, better if I can make it at home. But sometimes I have to buy it at Starbucks or the grocery store because I'm going to going somewhere. Yeah. And I looked up what a caramel macchiato costs at Starbucks. It's exactly. almost $7. Yeah. And there's people that get one every day. We do. Right? So that's $210 in coffee and sugar. But they won't pay $80 a month to have a doctor that has time to spend with them. Yeah, welcome to reality. Right. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Bravo. Thank you.